evening and you're very welcome to our special Christmas edition of Nationwide. This year we're coming to you from Lithuania and just to give you an idea of the country, well it's got a population of three and a half million, it's got 90 kilometres of coastline along the Baltic Sea and it's about three quarters the size of the island of Ireland. We're in the capital Vilnius and we've come here to find out a little bit more about the country which has given some 80,000 of its citizens to Ireland. That's a remarkable number of Lithuanians who've made Ireland their home over the last 10 years, making them the second biggest grouping of immigrants to Ireland after the Polish. This evening we're going to show you a little of the lifestyle, the history and the culture in the country that they've left behind. That's only the beginning of the lovely images of Vilnius and of Lithuania that you're going to see during the programme. Now, I'm here in the old town, and you really do have to go here to get a sense of the history of the place. We're going to have a tour in the company of Erika Bolodin. And Erika, looking around here, the, the different types of architecture are very striking. That's due to many, many things that happened that we have such interesting architecture. Uh, we were influenced by different cultures, different countries. And our artists and architects were coming from different countries. That's why we have different uh, styles. As well, there were many fires and wars, and many buildings were destroyed many times. Mm -hmm. How far back can you trace Vilnius? How old is it? Vilnius was founded in 1323, but this is an official date. Of course, people lived there a long time ago. Even in the pagan times, 10th century, 9th century, was already a temple here. So who's he? He is uh, our first uh, Grand Duke, first founder of the city, who was claimed Vilnius, the capital of, of the country in 1323. And also he was a founder of royal family. That's which, Gediminas. That's Gediminas, yes, who, his, uh, his family ruled Lithuania and Poland for 200 years. Then there were many different regimes. There were uh, Tsarist Russia, then it was the uh, First World War, so Germans, then Poles, then uh, Nazi during the Second Second World War and then was 50 years of Soviet occupation and now we are autonomous, we are a republic and we have our first lady president, the Lagribovskite. So this is the famous University of Vilnius, Erika. What a lovely location. Yes, it's historically very well located and that's the oldest university not only in the country but also in the Eastern Europe. It was founded in 1579 mm -hmm. and it's highly uh, appreciated. It's a uh, good quality of studies and it's not expensive. So that's all, all advantages. What I like about this city, Erika, is that you can do the whole tour on foot. And that's the best way to explore the city. Mm -hmm. And actually this is one of my favorite streets. Literatu Street, and you can see on the wall already. What are these? Uh, that's interesting project which was started last year when Vilnius was European capital of culture. Mm -hmm. That different artists dedicated their works to different uh, writers and poets. So, or every tile is dedicated for some book or or author. In an ironic twist of history. What had been a courthouse here in Vilnius in 1940 became the headquarters of the KGB. For a period during the Second World War, it housed the Gestapo and then reverted to the Soviets again. Now in that period, hundreds of thousands of Lithuanians were processed and deported under Stalin, deported to Siberia. But within these walls, thousands were put to torture, scores were put to death by shooting. Now, this is a genocide museum. And our guide in what is truly a chamber of horrors is uh, Remigia Pavlaskaita. Remigia, when did the KGB take over this building? 
In 1940, Lithuania was occupied by the Soviet Union. And when we can start the history of this period? An appalling period. Now, there, there were, of course, and they, many of them ended up in here, political prisoners, people who resisted the KGB. Yes, who were against Soviet Union. And the, the torture, what form did this take? Uh, you know, until Stan's death, we could do with the prisoners what we wanted. We could break, you know, bones, everything. How many Lithuanians died under the uh, About Soviet? About 50,000, but, you know, this number is not a very exact number. Not only Lithuanians suffered. But who else then? Uh, Jewish people. Because, of course, the Holocaust struck here as well. Yes. So Lithuania was occupied by Nazis during 1941-44. And how many Jews would have been? About 200,000. So this, this is a very huge number, about 90% of all Jewish people in Lithuania. Remigia, this is where this is the ultimate horror, this is where life ended for so many Lithuanians. This is the execution chamber? Yes, exactly. And more than 1,000 persons were executed in this place. Some mass graves were discovered in 1994. So, 767 bodies were found. And here you can see their personal belongings. And there are 80,000, maybe more Lithuanians uh, living in Ireland. And some of them harbor a great fear that their children could grow up uh, not fully understanding their own Lithuanian language. Well, to combat that, they have set up no fewer than nine Sunday schools around the country, specializing in giving those kids uh, the skill of reading, writing, speaking the language uh, properly. Geraldine Harney has been to one in Cork. It's Sunday morning and 12-year-old Ziggy Mandras is in class learning his mother tongue, Lithuanian. This school, which today is celebrating its fifth birthday, is on Cork's north side in Sunday's Well and has 50 students who every week come from all over Munster for four hours so as to improve their grasp of what is a difficult language to learn. Ziggy came to Ireland with his parents from Lithuania four years ago and in his now broad Tipperary accent he says his mother insists that he attends Sunday school. Oh, because my mother wants me to learn uh, Lithuanian properly. Why? Because she thinks I'm bad at it. And? And I need to uh, uh, read. Uh, I'm not really good at reading. While Ziggy attends school, his parents while away the four hours doing some shopping at the Lithuanian supermarket in Cork City. Like all mothers, Jenita only wants what's best for her son. Because, you know, it is really our language is Lithuanian language. Because I do not know what happened after 10 years. There will be his one to go back in Lithuania and he have to know grammar, have to know how to read and write, because it's not easy, it's very hard language. And these sentiments are echoed by all the other mums and dads who make the effort every Sunday to have their children here. They want their native language being part of their children's lives. In addition to upskilling the children in their native language, the nine schools around the country also teach the children about their culture, history and music. The Lithuanian ambassador to Ireland believes these schools are very important for the Lithuanian community. In, in order to, to, to remain Lithuanian and to, to keep that bond with, with Lithuania, it is important to, to, to study Lithuanian language, which is very archaic and different, difficult language and also to, to know about the tradition, history, uh, and all that. So, therefore, the, the Lithuanian schools here, it is not just, you know, for education. It's a, it's a very important pillar of the community, of their activities, of, of attracting people, for them to, to, to keep up with each other and to create that, that community. While there is quite a sizable Lithuanian community in Ireland, the reverse is not really true. There are very few Irish people living in the country here. But we have come across a young woman, grew up in Dublin, her name is Erica Jennings, 
settled here now and actually very famous. We'll talk about that in a little while. How did you end up here, Erica? Uh, my father came to work here about 15 years ago and the family stayed. Mm -hmm. And you uh, therefore had 15 years in Ireland and then the rest of your growing up here. Yeah. Quite a contrast. Yeah, I had serious culture shock when I arrived first because it was post-Soviet, It was they had just gained independence a few years and it was very, very different. Mm -hmm. But you're very famous here. You represented Lithuania in the, the Eurovision. Yeah. How many years ago? Uh, 2001. Mm -hmm. yeah. And was it through music that you met your husband, who's also in the business? Yeah, yeah. we met, you know, in the award show, after parties and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, tell me about the music that you play. Um, we play uh, a mix of styles. It's, I would call it eclectic pop, put it that way. And your group is called? Scamp. But is your husband in a different group? Yeah, his band is called Inculto. You're a busy woman then, Erica, because uh, as well as living in this uh, lovely apartment, which is more like a house, you've got a, a recording studio. Yeah, yeah, we record at home, which is great, and um, it works well. I don't think so. Uh, who would have expected that one day you'd find yourself making Irish coffees of all things in the town hall in Vilnius? Well, that's what we're doing today at the Christmas Bazaar for Charity, which is run by the Women's Association uh, here in Vilnius. But all the embassies in the capital have come on board this enterprise, setting up stalls which are showing off uh, some of the produce uh, of their countries. And the ambassadors are taking part in leading our team uh, for Ireland is our ambassador, Philomena Murnahan. Philomena, how are you? Nice to see you, Michael. Isn't it great to see the ambassadors uh, well, uh, ro rolling up their sleeves and taking part? Indeed, <laughs> and we do it with great pleasure. Uh, this is a wonderful occasion for to help charities here in, in Vilnius and in Lithuania. And Philomena, wearing your ambassador's hat, what's your job here in, in Lithuania? Well, my, my job is to represent Irish interests and also to promote Ireland. So, in one way, this is part of that job. Uh, but also to, to explain Ireland to the Lithuanians and also to report back to Ireland on what Lithuania is doing. Where do you see that relationship going? Yeah, I think because uh, particularly Lithuania is a member of the EU, we have a, a very direct connection now. Each member state's vote counts and all of the decision making within the EU. So it's very important and it's important that we have a presence here. Food production is an important part of the economy in Lithuania, so we've come now to the market in Vilnius to find out what it is that Lithuanians like to eat. And to give us that kind of insight, we're going to have a chat now with a local man, Limas Barthasonis. Limas, I noticed that we are starting at the cake stall. That suits me fine. All right, so <laughs> we're starting from the cakes because it's a Lithuanian cake by name Shakotis, and usually we're putting that cake on the Christmas table and it's made from the eggs and it's very tasty. Going away from the sweet counter, what about these dried mushrooms? Oh, all right, dried mushrooms. Uh, during, the, during the winter, you know, you, can, you can't find any mushrooms in, in, in the forest. So usually people drying them and it's very tasty to make soups. Even uh, people drying different herb, herbals, you know, just to make uh, the tea. It's very good if you are cold. So usually it's like a tradition to eat uh, a little bit small piece of the smoked meat, the fat and bread. It's pork, is it? Yeah, it's pork. But I as, try it? As, yeah, just try it. And as you can see, just most of the part is of the fat and small of the part just left of the meat and it's smoked. And usually you can use a, a little bit Lovely onion with, the onion with that, you know. Just. Is this your brown bread? Yes, it is our national Lithuanian brown bread. Well, we've now moved about 20 miles out of Vilnius to the area of Trakai, which had been the ancient capital of the country. And it was here that the Grand Duke Vidudas, who effectively was the founder of Lithuania, built this magnificent castle and palace for himself. We're now going to take a bit of a, a tour around it. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. you. I'm Dalia, <laughs> guide of Trakai you. History Museum. In the late 14th and early 15th century, Lithuania was one of the last remaining havens of paganism in all of Europe. It came under sustained attack from Teutonic Knights, crusaders who were bent on imposing Christianity by the sword. 
the Grand Duke Vidadas ruled a Lithuania which then stretched from the Baltic to the Black Sea and this castle was his home. It was built on an island and heavily fortified. Although never captured by the German crusaders, it was in fact destroyed by Russian armies in the 17th century. It then lay in ruins until a program of restoration was completed in the 1990s. It is a great ceremonial hall. Today, Trakai is a major tourism attraction. Its grand halls have been restored and displays reflect the life and times of the Archduke as well as evidence of the lifestyle of the wealthy Lithuanian nobility in the Middle Ages. Back in Vilnius, in the heart of the old town, there's a great array of interesting restaurants. And one of the best known is Bistro 18. It's run by an Irish-Lithuanian couple, Anne and Solace Touches. And I'm going to go inside now to have a chat and also to see a traditional Lithuanian dish being prepared. Hello Anne, I'm barging into your Hi. kitchen. Lovely to meet you. Very nice. All the way from? Uh, Farnham in Dublin. And settled in Vilnius. Yep. So you're going to tell us how to do um, a simple, simple traditional dish. dish. <laughs> okay, what is it? It's a zeppeline. Mm -hmm. um, or they are, they're usually served in twos. But it's made with potatoes and pork. It's a very traditional, very popular dish. Okay, and we can make them at home after we've watched you. So you get going. Okay. Uh, now, uh, nobody would win any prizes to deduce that you are related to Erica Jennings. That's right. The, the singer. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're like, um, the family's got family resemblance, it's just like that. You're sisters. Yes, we're sisters. You run this restaurant with your husband. I do, yes. And who's Lithuanian. Lithuanian. Yes, and he's mostly the chef. So you yeah. love cooking. Well, I, I actually, more than cooking, I kind of just love being with people. Um, I think I'm a pretty good front of house person and uh, that's really my role here. What's life like for you as a family? Probably slightly different to other people because it's the restaurant business and that's always quite high pressure and different hours. But I love living in Vilnius. I mean it's a great city, it's very accessible. I don't drive and I don't have to. It's really nice to be and people are lovely. Mm -hmm. I mean they really are. They're a bit more reserved than the Irish, but they're a lot more reserved than the Irish, but you know, that's okay too. Ooh, yes, that would be, that's what I would call soul food. Yeah. Will we have a little try? Let's do that. Okay, there's one for you. Thank you. And for me. So, will we... Take that off and then cut it right down the middle. Down the middle. Yep, like that. Oh, yes, it's kept its shape very well. There you go. So, as they say, the proof of the pudding is <laughs> in the eating. How do you think? Um, do you like them? I really do. Good. And I, you know. Okay. I wasn't sure, but I really do think yeah. that's really, really, really um, tasty. Yes. Well Always done. Always got good flavour. Thank you. In 50 years of uh, Soviet domination here in Lithuania, the communists tried desperately to repress or at any rate limit the influence of the Catholic Church uh, in the life of the people there. However, they didn't succeed and uh, even today like Roman Catholicism is hugely strong, one gathers, in uh, Lithuanian life. We're in the Berendine Church in Vilnius, which is under restoration, and uh, here we're going to hear uh, a Christmas carol service. But first we're going to have a word with Father Elgis. Father, how are you? Hello. Hello. Um, just how important is Catholicism still today in the lives of the people? Yeah, it's still important. It's really important. Mostly, I would say, the Catholic traditions. People baptize their children, they get married in, in the Catholic Church, and uh, it's really important, Catholicism, in the hearts and the lives of the Lithuanian people. And Father, this is the second church in Vilnius that I've seen uh, in the course of uh, restoration, but what caused it to fall into disrepair in the first place? Yeah, this church was uh, closed by Soviets in 1948, uh, and it was made into a warehouse, warehouse of the Academy of Art. It was a lot of abandoned, this church, and was reopened after the uh, independence of Lithuania. And were many churches closed by... The I would say half of the churches in Lithuania were closed, ruined and abandoned during the Soviet period.
beautiful music there from the children's choir at the Bernadine Church. Now we're in the Hotel Tilto and it wouldn't take you long looking around to figure out that it's got some Irish connections. It's actually the only Irish owned hotel in Vilnius. The proprietor is a Galway man, Aidan Corliss, and there are some people with Irish connections gathered here this evening for a pre-Christmas celebration. We're going to have a chat with some of them, beginning with this man here in the corner, James Clark, all the way from? County Cavan. From Cavan in Ireland. That's right. So tell us your story, how you came to live here in Lithuania and what you're up to. Uh, okay, um, <laughs> I'm here almost uh, 10 years. We live in uh, the port city, Klaipeda. That's you and your wife? My wife, Marina. Marina, who's Lithuanian? Yes, and we have a son, Daniel. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I came here, as I said, almost 10 years ago, and we have a real estate business there. So we uh, have developed some um, industrial buildings. We have a business park. We're involved in shopping centres. Mm -hmm. So we come to Vilnius now and again and uh, meet up with people here as well. Uh -huh. Are there things about home that you miss here? I always will. I miss the people, you know. I can't beat Irish people. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I miss food a little bit, you know. But uh, no, well, everything pretty much these days you have in all countries, you know. So, but people, I would say, pubs, they don't have the same pub culture as we have. So, Marina, what's it like being uh, married to uh, a Cavan man from Ireland? Amazing. <laughs> now, it's really good. He, um, I don't know, if you married an Irish guy, you have to get used to going to the pubs and being open and friendly to everybody, you know, and that's something that he taught me actually, you know, to be open-minded and and uh, love your country because he's very proud of his country and we go there very often, so he teaches me a lot of things and I guess it's nice, it's nice to be married to a guy like that. And you're going to spend uh, Christmas in Ireland? Yes, actually for the last five years we've spent every Christmas there and it was really nice. Of course, we all know that we Irish know how to hooli, but the Lithuanians have their very own traditions, and uh, we have come to the home of three Lithuanian students, Rutha, Agla, and Donata, to find out uh, how they go about celebrating their Christmas. And Rutha, Christmas Eve is your big day. Yes. And what actually happens? Uh, at first, I have to mention that on the table has to be 12 different dishes, mm -hmm. and I have to mention there has to be no meat, because on Christmas Eve people cannot eat uh, meat, uh, but on the first day of Christmas it's okay. You can eat pork, beef, whatever you want. And on the Christmas Eve then, uh, I mean the table is gorgeously set out, very festive and so on, but um, you have straw on the table? Yes, it's a tradition that you have to put some straw on the table and the rest straw has to be under the table. And that harks back to the manger and Bethlehem and so on. It is a lovely tradition and a, 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 a lovely table you've, you've set for us. So let's invite Mary in to join. This can't go to waste. <laughs> it's lovely to hear all about those traditions. Mm, will we try some? Of course. Okay. Good plan. Good plan. How about this? And while all this uh, feasting is going on, there's an empty chair. Yes, it's Lithuanian tradition that you have to leave empty space for a friend who's not with us because it shows that we do not forget people who cannot be on Christmas Eve. And that slice of tradition ends our Christmas program from Lithuania. We do hope you've enjoyed it. It is in fact the last nationwide of 2010 and uh, may we wish you the most wonderful 2011 to join us then. We're going to leave you with some Christmas music. Inside St. Catherine's Church here behind us is one of Lithuania's best known and oldest choirs. It's the Azua Lucas Male Voice Choir. Azua Lucas means Little Oak and they're going to perform a Lithuanian carol for us. It's called On a Silent Night. But before we go over to them we would like to say to everyone at home, particularly the Lithuanian community spending Christmas in Ireland, from all of us on your nationwide team, Sujventum Kalerdum Ish Vilnius. And that, of course, means Happy, Happy Christmas. Christmas.